We're going to wait for the pastor to work his way back to the seat here. Isn't he awesome? We got a great pastor. It is with great honor to stand up here today to recognize some of the greatest people. I know it's the saints of God, but we're going to go a little bit further. And that's the veterans of our country, of our nation. Amen. If you haven't had a chance, go out and look at the table, some of the uh, pictures and uniforms. If you don't recognize one guy with a lot of hair, it's Brother Jeff Epinette. But uh, look at them and um, respect them and honor them as we are going to honor them today. If all the veterans of our armed forces would please stand across the sanctuary. Amen. Wow. Thank y'all. Let's give them a hand. Good God. God bless you. you. May be seated. One of the things that the military people do back and forth is joke at each other, and they got the right to do that. Hey Amen. When you wear the uniform, you've earned the respect and the honor of each other. And the pastor made a comment this morning. He said, "If you're high intelligence, you're in the Air Force." If you're low intelligence, you're in the army. I leaned over to Brother Dixon. I said, well, what if you have no intelligence? He said, you're a Marine. (laughs) 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 Oh, oh, yeah, I know, I know. I'm going to give y'all a history lesson 101, so just hang in there if you didn't know it. Why do we celebrate Veterans Day on November the 11th? You see, back in 19, I mean, back in the 1900s in World War I, there was 35 countries in that war. Finally, after five years, the leaders came together and said, look, we're killing, we're dying too many men, too many people are dying. Let's get together and come together for a agreement of a truce, and they called it the Armitus. And that lasted for a while. And the next thing you know, World War II stepped in. They still kept an armistice day on November the 11th. But you see, when they signed that agreement, it was on the 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month when that was signed. And that, like I said, it stayed for a while until World War II started. When they got going and then it moved into the Korean War, President uh, Wilson had declared this But now President Eisenhower at the time said it will no longer be called Armistice Day. We're going to call it All Veterans Day to honor all veterans. Well, then next thing you know, the the, uh, United States was catapulted into Vietnam War. And they took away the word all and just left it at that. But you see, when President Wilson was president back in the early 1900s, he declared that America would stop on November the 11th at 11 o'clock in the morning. Across the nation, everybody would stop. Working, going to school, shopping, whatever they did, they would stop. And for two minutes, they would pause and honor the men who died, the men and women who were in uniform. And, for, and I mean, it just it blew me away that the whole nation of America honored that. And we are honoring them today as a nation. We did it yesterday. And we're doing it as a church today. Because we know we would not be here if we had not had these men and women. Amen. Amen? We would be hiding somewhere. We would be in Brother Nathan's house having church. But I'm just saying we would not be like this. We can walk out in the streets and protest. And we can do the, the you know, freedom of speech. We did this because of our veterans today. And we honor you very much. And we appreciate your works and your workings. And, amen. And your sacrifice. And we pray for the families who had to go through this with them. Amen. So what I want us to do is close our eyes and bow our heads and for a few seconds, in a moment of silence, remember these who are battling and fighting today and keeping that peace for us. If you'll bow your heads.
Father, thank you so much for being our protector and our keeper. And you being the hedge around these men and these women that are protecting our country and our rights today. We pray you will be their shield and you will be their blessing, be their healer, and be their counselor in times of battle. Father, we pray for the families of those that have gone on and those that are serving today, that you will comfort them in this hour, be with them today, and we give you the praise and the glory for all things are to you and by you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. God bless you. Pastor. Why don't we all one more time put our hands together and thanks to all those who have served. Thank you. We honor you today. Amen. Brother Jeff, I'm sorry about him picking on you. What rank were you when you were out? When you got out of the Air Force, what rank were you? Army National E4. So you're in the same situation I'm in. Your wife outranked you. Lisa was a captain in the Air Force, and she's been ordering you around ever since, hasn't she? You and I need to go out and, and sh cry in our beer together sometime. Have sorry, not beer, but maybe non-alcoholic beer. You see what I'm saying? Amen. God bless you all today. I love you. I want to make you aware of a few things. And I have, uh, uh, let's see, a couple of quick announcements. Today's Taco Sunday. So they're making tacos right now. And we have the best tacos at our church. We have the best Mexican food, like, in the southeast here at the church. If you don't believe that, you really just are not in the know. So right after church, you get two tacos, beans, and rice for uh, a donation. So... All right. Uh, my first steps class starts a new cycle today. If you are new here or you just have questions about the church or you just like to hang out with me for a little while, the class normally is a little over an hour. And um, I try to answer questions, uh, give you some history on the church, all of that good stuff. And so that is today. Also, Christmas banquet. If you want to go and dress up to the first church prom, that is also known as the Christmas banquet. Uh, I need to see Ed. He will help you out with that. Also, we are doing the food drive for those in need to, to give boxes to those who are um, in need. Uh, if you can help us with that, see uh, Venice. If you know someone who has a uh, is a need, has a need, we want to take them a box. Uh, we want to be express our thanksgiving by supporting others. Can I have an amen? amen. Also, if you would be thoughtful and prayerful today, I received a. Uh, phone call from a pastor. I've had a very interesting week. I, uh, I've come, been contacted people who, who don't like me, and I've been contacted by people who uh, think I'm the best thing since soap. So it's just been a crazy week. I can't please anybody. And so <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, I had a pastor contact me, and uh, he told me, th this is what he said to me. It's actually uh, Jeremy's dad. I didn't even know he listened to my teaching and my preaching. I had no idea. He probably thinks I'm ruining his son, so he was checking in on me. You know, um, he just called me out of the blue. Jeremy didn't know what he was calling me about. I was like stalking his dad. Why would your dad want to talk to me? I'm nervous. Is he mad at me? Have you said ugly things about me? And Jeremy had said ugly things about me, but not to his dad. And so um, we didn't know what was going on there. So I finally got my nerve up and I called him. I didn't know what to expect. And he just he just blessed me. He, he spoke life to me. He, uh, he just said, I, I, I've been listening to you preach. And I want you to know I love your vision. I love what the Lord's doing through you. And uh, I was so inspired by the last Sunday. That's the Sunday we had uh, Lance Stockman here. He said, I have an opportunity this Sunday night, which is this Sunday night, he said, to preach to a large interdenominational group in my city. There's going to be like 25 churches there. And he said, I wanted to call you and ask if you and your church would join with me to pray that something really positive and some blessing will come out of that event. So today, if you'll be remembering uh, Pastor Bunner in Louisiana, he is preaching to a large group of interdenominational uh, Christians tonight. And so we want to pray the blessings of the Lord upon him. 
him. The Lord would bless him and, and speak through him and guide him. And uh, so I wanted you to help me to pray uh, for him today and think about, think of, keep your thoughts and prayers with him. I'm going to read from Matthew chapter number eight. Uh, if, excuse me, not Matthew, John chapter number eight. Why don't we stand together and we will read together. Uh, John chapter number eight. We are looking at verse number one, and I will probably skip down through this a little bit. Uh, the context is Jesus is at the Mount of Olives, which is a very important place in the life of the Jewish faith. Uh, a lot of gathering there, a lot of teachers gather there, a lot of religious meetings there and the like, and uh, he's teaching, and there are people sitting around as he teaches. Scribes and Pharisees bring a woman caught in adultery. Now, at this moment, you you know this story. You have heard this story many, many times. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery, brought to Jesus, and they are trying to trap Jesus. And I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. And Jesus answers famously by having, uh, he first ignores the, the, the Pharisees and he just begins to write in the sand. And finally, uh, when they persist in asking, he, he says this famously, let him, that is without sin, yes, you guys know the story, cast the first stone. And then he says this, immediately after, immediately after, let me, let me uh, read at verse number 11 where he, Jesus has just asked, where are your accusers? Has anyone condemned you? And she says, no, Lord. And he says, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them. Somebody say, then. Then Jesus spoke to them. What has just happened that's important? Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for coming today. Our friends, our guests, thank you. I, I have great affection for you. I thank you for worshiping with us, joining together with us. I want to teach the word of the Lord to you. I want you to receive it. I want you to be impacted by it. I, I love to teach the word of the Lord. Sometimes I teach longer than other people love for it to happen. And um, someone I love very much this week publicly criticized how long I had been uh, preaching lately. And um, I tried to defend myself, but since she out ranks me. She threw me in the same position that Lisa throws Jeff. So it was really a difficult time and a really random week of bizarre happenings. But the Lord, the Lord shall fight our battle. See how I did that? I just went spiritual. <laughs> the Lord will fight my battles. You men should remember that when your wife's down on you and they're like, you need to clean the garage. You just need to say, the Lord shall fight my battles. Of course, they'll say, but he won't clean the garage. It's, you know, anyway, I'm glad you're here today. I love you in the Lord. Uh, so uh, let me start by reading a quote from Robert Baden Powell. Good advice. Try and leave this world a little better than you found it. And when your turn comes to die, you can die happy in feeling that at any rate you have not wasted your time but have done your best. Uh, leaving things better than we found them is something that is the act of a mature person who acknowledges all the many things they cannot do. And rather than protesting what they cannot do or cannot fix, they decide to at least try to make it better than it was. If you live very long, and most of you are doing a good job of that. I don't think we have any dead people here. There was some dead people in the 9 a.m. service. It was really weird. <laughs> if you live any length of time at all, you'll you figure out there is a bunch of things you can't fix. I didn't get a single amen except for Meg's. She was the only amen I got in this whole house. And she was thinking about her husband, and she's exactly right. There is a bunch of things we can't fix. Amen. Right. Amen. Now what? I can't fix it. I'm in the people business. I work with people. Uh, they ask me for advice. I try to give good advice. They come to me with problems. Some I can fix, most I can't. 
In fact, there seems to be a one to 99 ratio. If there's a problem I can fix, there's 99 I can't. If you work with people, you you understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you're a parent, (laughs) you know exactly what I'm talking about. My poor parents have been trying to fix me for years. It's it's really, y'all pray for them. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, there, there's a ton of things we can't fix. Uh, on an almost daily basis, I, I have this emotional reality of overwhelming desire that I could fix something. Almost on a daily basis. And I'm not just talking about, you know, my car needs tires. I mean, I'm talking about people going through terrible circumstances. People going through difficult uh, painful, hauntingly damaging events. And I have to watch. I can't fix it. Uh, There was a a lady who our church has known and loved her. And she attended our church recently. And it was a a day when we had, uh, in fact, it was this past Sunday, and it, it was a day we were celebrating miracles and signs and wonders. And she lost, she lost her daughter and she sent me a message afterwards just saying, you know, um, and she wasn't in any way criticizing her to be angry. She was just kind of thinking, reflecting. You know, sometimes God doesn't heal you. Sometimes God doesn't fix it. And how we handle that says more about our Christianity amen. than when we have the Christmas list. Can I have a better amen? amen. Uh, so, people... All of us are weighted and freighted with things we cannot fix. You might have a health problem that's chronic, and you get so worried with it. You might have a job you hate. You might be in a bad relationship. I wish, I wish it wasn't so. Uh, I wish it wasn't so. I wish I could pretend like, you know, all relationships are good. Uh, but man, that would leave out a lot of humanity. Um, whether it's family, whether it's sibling, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a parent, child, a lot of us are stuck with crazy people. And sometimes we are the crazy people. That would have been a t- chance for you to say, amen, Tina, where are you at? <laughs> now what? Okay, we're, 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 we're stuck. It's Brother Mullings, one of my favorite uh, preachers, pastors. I'm going to have him come preach here sometimes, pastors in California. Well, he's retired now, but um, he has this saying. He wrote a book called People Are Pitiful, But We're All People. <laughs> Isn't that the God truth? That's the truest thing I've said all day. People are pitiful and we're all people. Um, Jesus finds himself in this situation. He is teaching the people. People are coming to hear him. They are coming to him as a rabbi. They are not coming to him as the son of God. You got to see. They don't know he's the son of God. That all will be revealed they don't know he is the one. There may be one or two people out there like Peter who is thinking, man, this, I, this, this is the Messiah, the son of the living God. Most of the people think of him as a great religious thinker, a great religious teacher, uh, someone who can make sense of a confusing world, someone who can show us a way of being. It's like you go to a teacher because they teach you a way of being. They, they show you how to deal with complexity. They, they show you how to make things better when it's a mess. And so you go and you listen and you try to learn and the people are coming to listen to Jesus and they're, they're gathered around and there's a, there's a group there that want to see Jesus fail because to, to them he represents the wrong way the, the nation or the, the faith of Judaism should go. They think that Jesus direction is dangerous. Stay with me. I know they're having some drama over there but that's just because Jonathan knocked the thing down and his wife will take care of him later. Don't even worry about that. So they think the Jesus direction is the wrong direction. They're, they're sincere. They're zealous. They're not, they're not bad people in the sense of, oh, they, they want to bring destroy, destruction upon the, Judy, the, the faith of Judaism. They're, they're really zealous, good people, but the Jesus path is dangerous. And so they think, the, how can we convince all these people that Jesus has influence with? Because Jesus does have lots of influence with all these people. And they realize they're competing for the minds of the people. 
you see. And they say, how can we set up a trap, a trick, where the people will see the Jesus way is the wrong way and the temple way, the mosaic law culture, you know, what way, that's the right way. How do we show the people that Jesus is dangerous? And so they come up with this trap. They, 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 I don't know how long they had to look and how hard it was. I don't know how much of a peeping Tom you have to be to catch someone in the act of adultery, but they succeeded. I mean, for like uh, uh, three hours, they're like, are they doing it? Are they doing it? Are they doing it? Oh my God, they're doing it. Call the police. Do you see? Can you see the dysfunction in their zeal? Can you see? They got them. <laughs> Don't you put them clothes back on. We busted you. So they take her. All this is a setup. Their goal is not to discipline the woman. They've no, probably known about her for a long time. Their goal is not to fix the culture. Their goal is to show the people the Jesus way is dangerous. And the way to win the people is to put this artificial construct between the law of Moses that the people revere and the ministry model of Jesus. That, that, that's the goal. And so they, they catch this woman. Hopefully they let her get some clothes on, you know. Um, who knows? And they, they drag her out there. I don't know what happened with the man, but us men have had it good for years. That's what I got to say. It's you dirty women. that Y'all are the bad ones. I'm, I'm joking, guys. You know I love you. I'm just having fun. Nobody laughed, and I feel all awkward all of a sudden. <laughs> so um, here we go. Let's take her to Jesus. The woman doesn't matter. She's a prop. Uh, they bring her to Jesus. And there's two competing models. And they're going to be shown here. Let's, let's, let's first talk about the woman, okay? Um, prostitution is a, a human thing. It's in every culture that they have records of. Uh, very, very much a human, a human problem. And the interesting thing about prostitution is uh, very, very few prostitutes would advocate for what they do. Uh, none of them run outside and say, hey, I hope when you kids grow up, you can do it like me. No, no. Um, they're, they're very much, they have a sense of being trapped. Uh, the BBC did a... Uh, article on a lady who is uh, from Chicago. Uh, she is. She runs a nonprofit uh, that helps women get out of the life. And she. They wrote her story up, and I, I read it this past week. And you talk about just being overwhelmed. It's just whoa. Uh, her her mother died when she was six months old, and she was raised by an alcoholic grandmother who, in her way, tried as best she could. But you know, grandmother was broken. And broken people break people, yes, right? Hurt people hurt people. That's the cycle of sin, the generational curse. You don't need a special demonic invasion for that. That's just the product of sin. Okay, so here's this girl. She's, she's growing up. Uh, her early memories are, are watching her grandmother drink herself unconscious, and then men in the neighborhood rape her in her house. And um, she, that was kind of her formative uh, years. She, she, she grew up and she had two children uh, before the age of 14. She had two children before the age of 14. And she gave them to her grandmother to raise. And her grandmother told her she had to do something to get money. Uh, she, she didn't tell her what. She just said, you ha we have to have money to raise these children. She was 14 years old. She, she said she bought a pair of plastic high heels from the dollar store, paid $2.50 for them, put on a, uh, a shiny dress that she got from the dollar store. And she went out and started walking the the street, and uh, she knew at 14 what was going on, and, and the first day out there, she said she turned five tricks. If this makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry. We can tell a story about a pink polka dot doll later, but this is real life, okay? So, so the first day, she sold five tricks, and um, she said she cried at every one of them. She cried through every one of them, and, and the men, she said, they, they knew what they were doing much better than she did, so they just kind of guided her through the process, and she went home that first day uh, and gave her grandmother $400, and um, that was the beginning. And now she 
for the next 25 years, worked as a prostitute. She says the first 10 or 15, she didn't do drugs. Uh, she just, she was, she didn't know what else she could do. And nothing else could make that kind of money. She's trapped in the life. She started doing drugs after somewhere between 10 and 15 years just to raise her courage up. And uh, she, she's been shot over the years. She said, uh, everyone's mean. Everyone is mean to you. That's what you don't get about the life. Everyone is cruel to you. Everyone. The men who use you, the men who walk by, they all think you are worthless and trash and they treat you like that. And she, she, she over the years, she was shot five times. Uh, she was stabbed multiple, multiple times. She was uh, beat up many, many times. Um, she tells a story about how uh, when she, after 25 years, um, she was demanding a guy pay her, and they were in the car, and he kicked her out of the car without paying her, and reached over and slammed the door and gunned it and roared off, but her, her jacket got caught in the door of the car, and for six blocks, she was dragged along Chicago asphalt. And when they finally found her, uh, when they realized what had happened and they called the, uh, her whole upper body was skinned, half of her face was all skinned off, and she was just in a mess. And she said, uh, when they took her to the hospital, she was conscious. She said, the police officer who brought her in told the ER people who received him, oh, she's just a hooker. She probably tried to steal somebody's money and got what she deserved. And she says this, she says, in 25 years, I never one time felt as though I had had a way out. That's the thing. That's the thing. 25 years, she never felt like she had a way out. Okay. Um, it's not as though she was riding down the interstate and there was a sign up that said, ahead, exit ramp. You can get help. We'll support you. Things can be better. Just get off there. It's as though you're trapped in a canyon and you cannot get out. And she said, in that ER, after she heard that policemen say that. And he was just, he, you know, the job makes them callous. So let's not judge them too harshly. They, their, their callousness is a form of coping. Okay. And so, and so he, he, she sat there, she said, she said, she prayed. She said, God, nobody cares about me. If there's anybody who will care, will you help me cross paths with them? And she said, the Lord answered almost immediately because right after that, a worker, not a social worker, but a volunteer came and she ran a halfway house for people trying to get out of that life and uh, for prostitutes, battered women and the like. And she lived there. This lady said she lived in this house for two years while she figured out who she was, figured out what she was going to do. She had to refigure everything out. She didn't know who she was. She had to get off drugs. She had to learn skills. She said, for 25 years, I had been used as a toilet. And finally, there was somebody to help me get out of that situation. So, so um, that, that, is, that, that is us trying to be fair to the prostitute, okay? Uh, the vast majority of women in prostitution, or I, this is true, I believe, also of men, although uh, uh, men, uh, prostitutes, are, there's much less data on them. But if you do any of the sociological data on them, the vast majority of them were abused as children, and um, they had very limited opportunities, and one thing leads to another. There, there is a few who choose the lifestyle uh, because of a certain ability to make money, or they're going to do it for a sort of time, but th that's such a small number, it's hard to understand the profession that way. And so here you have this prostitute. I don't know how she ended up in this life, but I promise you she's not out at the jobs fair saying, I've got a great opportunity for all you young ladies. You should think about this. There is some sense of her being trapped and helpless. And the religious communities drug her out before Jesus and said she should be stoned because Moses said so. Jesus has to answer. Okay, we've tried to be fair to her, okay? We've tried to be fair. Now let's try to be fair to the Pharisees. You see, if, if we judge the Pharisees in the same manner they judge the woman, then we're just the reverse Pharisee. Do you see? Let's try to be fair to the Pharisees. What do the Pharisees want? The Pharisees want a safe environment. They want clear lines of good people and bad people because it makes them feel safe. On the inside, the Pharisee is terrified. Do you see? They're afraid that bad people are going to mix with good people. They're afraid that 
are precious children who have no exposure to sin and the like. They're going to be destroyed if they come in contact with these bad people. And so the Pharisee, in order to make themselves feel safe, they want to have clear rules of delineation between the good and the bad. That way we can avoid the bad and we can clump together with the good. Look, this is eminently understandable. If you can't have sympathy for that, you've never been a parent. You act ignorant and see if I let my kid come over your house. You see what I'm saying? I get it. I understand. I understand that. And to make sense of the world, the Pharisee and the scribes and the religious community, because this is not just a Pharisee thing. This is a religious thing. What you want to do is you want to have this kind of hierarchy in your mind of who is the good. They... They do the good, and who is the bad? They do the bad. And what we can do is we will castigate the bad person as a way of protecting ourselves and conditioning our children. This is understandable. I understand this. There's somebody crazy in my neighborhood. My kids aren't going to play with them. Do you see? It's understandable. Everybody in their own way is trying to make sense of this risk, this, this challenge. How do we have the good? How do we build the good? How do we keep society safe? How do we reward the people who, you know, do their homework and show up on time? And how do we punish the people who end up in these sinful professions? We've got to make sense of this. We've got to make it all kind of hang together. And so, for the, the religious heart, for the, the religious crowd, for the scribes, for the, 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 the Pharisees, they, they want to do this by identifying people by what they do. If you do bad, then you are bad. If you do bad, then you are advocating for the bad. If you sin, then you advocate for sin. And what we need is law to protect us good people from you bad people because we are willing to keep the law and you are unwilling to keep the law. Therefore, it's a shame when Jesus hangs out with people who are not advocating for the law. It is an embarrassment when Jesus, in some way, instead of hanging out with us people who keep the law, goes and eats lunch with people who transgress the law. Jesus, don't you see? This is a shame. What you have here is two different ministry models. And this is something that is very much a real concern. It's something that we, all of us, particularly as parents, all of us wrestle with and we all want to get right because we believe it matters, right? We believe it matters. We want to get this right. There's two different models here. And on this side, this is the religious, the religious solution to the heart problem, okay? And you can be very, we're going to be sympathetic to the Pharisees. They are coming up with a religious solution to the problem of the heart. And that solution is this. If you do bad things, you are bad. If you go to bad places, you are bad. If you become if you hang out with bad people, you are bad. You are what you do, and that's the end of the story. If through will and grit and determination you are willing to do good, then with time and appropriate repentance and appropriate virtue signaling to the community, we can slowly move you over, 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 and eventually you can become one of us good people who were before one of these bad people. That is the religious solution. This is what the Pharisees are doing. Moses wants us to stone her because the community needs to see that sin doesn't pay. Thus, law is the answer. Come on, work with me here. Don't get quiet and looking at me like I'm crazy. I'm just telling a story. Law is the answer. Let's, let's stone her. Let's pass a law. Let's get the right judge. Let's do what needs to be done. You see, here's the problem. We all of us carry the Garden of Eden in our hearts. It's not just a story from old. We all of us are tempted to play God. We all of us want to bite into the apple that allows us to be as God and pass judgment on others. Why? It makes us feel safe. 
We feel safe when we do that. Our world has order to it. It has clear lines to it. This is not an issue. You see, here's the problem with the story of this lady. We, in our carnality, see this as an issue of liberal versus conservative. This is not an issue of liberal versus conservative. It is silly to see Jesus in terms of liberal versus conservative. It just shows immaturity on the part. It's a silly position to take. In one position, like this story, he seems like a liberal. In another position when he's running the uh, money changers out of the temple, he seems like a conservative. Don't try to figure it out. See the heart of the matter. Because the issue was how do we address the issue of the heart? And religion says this is how you do it. You don't uh, you, you, people who are uh, not do, do bad, they are bad. People who go bad places, they are bad people. They have been labeled, they have been, they have been clumped and therefore we need a law to deal with them. Here's Jesus. They bring this problem to him. He ignores their trap. And he begins to write in the sand. I don't know what he wrote. No one knows what he wrote. If anybody tells you they know, they're crazy and they're just talking. They have an ulterior motive. Nobody knows what he wrote. He may have wrote hints to secret sins. That's my favorite theory. He may have written Old Testament scripture. Who knows? Point is, he wrote, and when they continued asking him, holding their stones in their hand, ready to stone this woman, he says this, let he that is without sin cast the first stone. And slowly, from the eldest to the youngest, they begin to drop their stones, and they begin to walk away, and Jesus says, neither do I condemn thee. Notice the irony. The only one who has no sin is the one who is unwilling to condemn. The only one who has power is the one who is unwilling to use power. The one who is a judge is the only one unwilling to judge. Leave your apples in Eden. I know it wasn't an apple, whatever, I'm having fun. I'm being poetical. So, this is a different way of seeing ministry and understanding the problem of the heart. Rather than having this clear line, good people do good things, bad people do th bad things, Jesus wants you to look at your own heart and see your potential to do both good things and bad things. Jesus wants you to see, when you see the prostitute, that you have a prostitute in you. Um, I didn't get a single A, man. It was pitiful. When you see the person who lacks temperance and always losing their temper, you should see you have the potential to be a person of lack of lacks temperance and always losing your temper. When you see there's certain kind of things that are despicable to me, that's despicable to me, and you have your things. I, something that's despicable to me is a man who will who beat a, a woman or a child. It just it's despicable to me, man, and it just makes me want to fight. You just give me a, that, give me that image, and I'm ready to fight. I'm like, hit me, hit me. Let's see how this works out for you. Come on, hit me. Don't hit them. Hit me. They're like 60 pounds. Come on, hit me. I'm here. I'm a, I'm your Uncleberry. <laughs> you understand? I have to see. I have to see. There's a wife beater in me. All I have to do is let myself go. There's ugly sin in me. Why is there such a difference between the ministry model of Jesus and the ministry model of the Pharisees? Because Jesus will never let you pretend you're better than anybody else. And it is right after this that Jesus astonishes us with this statement. I am the light of the world. What? What? Really? Now you're going to lay that on us? You ever have a friend who says things that make sense, but they're always at the wrong time? You have a friend like that? Anyway, enough about Brother Ed. Uh, <laughs> that was funny. I don't care what you say. <laughs> um, you, you know what I mean? It's not that they say something wrong. It's just like bad timing. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, let's say, for example, you're standing, you're in a group of people, and they're talking about the latest crazy guy who went in the Texas church and shot up people. And, um, 
you know, uh, and you're like, man, that's so terrible, man. I don't know what this world is coming to. Everybody's like talking, worried. I don't know, man. I hope no one does that for us. And blah. You know, it's just scary sometimes. And then someone says, man, I had some great cheesecake this week. <laughs> now, everything they said was fine. It's just like, where did that, that, you win the random award. There's like this award said random has your name on it. Okay, gee, what do you mean you're the light of the world? Why, 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 why? It's all how we think in terms of light. This business of light matters because Jesus told you to be the light of the world too. This is a recurring theme in the New Testament. This matters. This matters. This matters because Jesus says, let your light shine. And so when Jesus speaks hope and grace to somebody, and he accepts her as not better than himself, even though he's quite better than her, even though he has no sin, and he does that, and he says, I am the light of the world. Now, he's going to tell you, you ought to be the light of the world. He's going to tell you to let your light shine. He's going to tell you to let your light be lit on a hill and let it shine. Jesus, what are you talking about? Can't you just make it simple for us? Why do we have to think? I'm tired of thinking. Just give me a formula. I can make it simple. Then I don't have to think. So, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. So, this is a, when I think of light, and just stay with me a moment more. I'm only going to preach a couple more hours. Um, when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, you know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of when he's 12 years old and he's astonishing the lawyers at the temple because he's given such profound insight into the word of God. And then all of the doctors and lawyers are like, "Woo! I've never seen anybody so smart. Then Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Except that's not when he said it, right? When we think, I am the light of the world, we think of Jesus giving the Olivet Discourse when he speaks in such ministry depth and with such prophetic insight that the only people there is Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Everybody else, the other disciples are like, whoa, that's too heavy for me. It's just these inner disciples, and Jesus has given the Olivet Discourse, and he's talking about prophecy to come. He's talking about a world beyond this world. He's talking about judgment. He's talking about Jerusalem. Nobody to this day makes sense of all of it. But he had something to say, and he knew exactly what he was talking about. And in time, we will understand it better by and by. Okay? Now we expect him, having had our mind blown with insights we can't fathom, now we expect him to say, I am the light of the world. Because the kind of light we want to give people is the light that leaves them impressed with us. The kind of light we want to leave with people is when they all of a sudden see the grand mysteries they've never seen before. But that's not the kind of light Jesus has given. Jesus is looking at somebody who is broken and saying, I refuse to point out your hopeless, broken condition and judge you in that condition. Instead, you're not going to get condemnation from me. This is what you're going to get from me. Another chance and an admonition to do better. Another chance and an admonition to do better. Another chance and an admonition to do better. I am the light of the world. Hear me, church. First church, if we ever can get this, I'm telling you what, it's, it'll, it'll revolutionize our interactions with people. And it goes like this. There are a million situations in this world I can't fix. There are a million people in this world I can't fix. I can still be their light. Oh, you didn't hear that part. I, you didn't hear that part. I can't fix them. The truth is they were broken when they were young. They were in a terrible situation. They were broken when they were young. I don't know how they ended up in this situation. I don't want them to continue, but you won't find me with a stone in my hand. I am not going to say you're a bad person because you do bad things. I'm going to say... We are all of us bad people. And if it's not for the grace of God, we are all of us yet without salvation. But God in his mercy loved us. And God in his charity extended mercy to us. And I've been changed by his love. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works 
and glorify your Father in heaven. In other words, Jesus is saying it's time for you to be the change agents. It's time for you to be the change agents. We live our life in such a way that even if we can't fix it, we make it better. Jesus does not follow this woman home with a seven-point self-help program. He does not show up to check on her performance. He simply says, I'm not going to condemn you, and I want you to do better. I am not your judgment. I want you to do better. You know, we all of us come from different contexts. I am rich today. I'm not talking about money. I am a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy person. I'm wealthy because I grew up with a church that loved me. We weren't a big church back then, but they were so kind to me. There's a few of you still around. I don't mean to say that old, that you're old because you're not, but, oh, sorry. Sister Lois loved me when I was a little good-for-nothing tomcat. She loved me. Now, she looked for opportunities to beat me every chance she got. <laughs> She loved me. I am rich in people who love me. Do you see? Do you see? As a result, I've been able to have a certain kind of life. I'm blessed. I am, I am the, I am the, I am the 1% in terms of love. I was blessed. Where are you at, Diane? Diane, she loved me growing up. Rick and Nancy are traveling. Uh, they're they're, they're on, going to Louisiana today, but they, they loved me, a little kid running around the church. Rick would catch me outside throwing rocks. He'd tell my dad, my dad had beat me with an inch of my life. I am rich. I am rich. I wasn't raised by alcoholic parents. I was raised by parents who loved me. My, my son, he's not in here good. My son, um, he's at an age now where he, he will just randomly come in and want to talk to me and tell me about something ridiculous like a Power Ranger or an imaginary dinosaur or something. It's just whatever. He'll come in and he'll, he's designing this game where he's got this checkerboard and the, the dinosaurs are animals. There's all kind of animals on it. And I had to order all these animals for him. And he's come up with rules. And the animals, they can jump over each other and transform the other one. And then if you end up with all predators, you win. If you end up with all herbivores, then you, you lose. Anyway, moving on. When I, when, I, when I, I remember when I was a little kid, and I was the one going to tell my mom and dad that. I remember my mom being in her room, sitting in her bed, reading a book. Probably a sinful, ungodly cowboy book, but... <laughs> probably a sinful cowboy book where they said darn and heck and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> Sinners in the hands of an angry God. But I walk in there. I'd just be a little kid. And I'd have something to tell her about an imaginary plane or something. And I never remember ever being brushed off. Never. Not a single time did she say, I'm busy. All my memories are of her folding the page of the book, laying it down on the deal, pulling her knees up, putting her hands on the knee and leaning forward into me. That's my memories. I am rich. I'm rich. If you grew up with a mother and father, forget whether or not they were perfect. That's a stupid, that, that's just dumb. There is no perfect. Okay, God is perfect. The rest of us, well, eh. forget if they were perfect. If they loved you, you're rich. If they did their best with whatever they had to help you, you're rich. Quit sucking your thumb. Get over it. They loved you. You see what I'm saying? So well, my point is this. My point is this. We, we are rich. There are so many broken people in the world. They did not grow up in this cocoon of love with good advice and early intervention. You see, that's how you stay out of trouble, early intervention. It's the kids who don't have early intervention that end up in prison. Do you see what I'm saying? If you did something stupid, your mama catches, she knocks you down a flight of stairs. That's early intervention. That's a good thing. You ought to thank God for every one of them stairs all the way down. You get up and say, bless her, bless her, bless her. Why? I'd rather you fall down a flight of stairs than spend 20 years in federal prison. So I, I don't, 
I, I'm having fun. I don't mean to abuse a child and knock them down a flight of stairs. Please don't hold me on that. I'm just having a good time up here. I know my mom did that to me, but it, you know, you don't, should not do that to children. How do we minister to a broken world? Well, there's two models. There's two models. Okay? One of them is very safe. It's very safe. And that model is we define people's value by what they do. If they do bad things, they're bad people. Okay? And that's the end of it. Now, I'm not saying that as a church, we don't want to have appropriate safeguards and appropriate standards of requirements because all of those things are just good common sense. You understand that. But as a heart issue, in the manner at which we view other people, we have to get away from this model over here where I'm good and you're bad. I'm in the covenant and you're out of the covenant. We've got to get to a grace-driven model that says if it were not for Jesus Christ, I would be that person. If it were not for this love of I, I've been raised in, if it were not for the blessings in my life, how can I make it better? God put you in this world to make it better. He did not put you in this world to fix it. You can't fix it. And fixing it is a path to insanity, but you can make it better. How do you make it better? Here's a good place to start. You are the light of the world. Do people feel hope when they're around you? Do they feel acceptance when they're around you? Do they feel your unwillingness to carry around a rock in your hand? And instead they feel from you, you're dropping all the rocks around you. And you're saying, oh no, oh no. I, I want to see God's blessing for you. I want to see God's best for you. I want to see, you know what? I just believe that things are going to start from this very moment. There's going to be something that starts for the better in your life. That is a completely different idea. But that is the power of Christianity. Christianity gains influence through the character of the messenger. Christianity loses influence through the character of the messenger. We must be the light we proclaim. And we are all of us tempted in all the bad situations of our lives to be drains and not fountains. I'm ending with this. A drain is somebody who sucks from everything else around you. You have a bad day, you drain all the energy out of your house. You have a setback at work, you go home and drain all the joy out of your family and your kids. You have a problem at church, you drain all the the situation out of the ministry. If you're in the music department and, and Meg is mean to you, it's just besides, normally she's just mean to her husband, but let's say she's mean to you, and now you just drain all the joy out of it. You don't like your role, so you drain all the joy out of it. You're mad because Pastor Nate didn't give you a leading part in the Christmas drama, so you drain all the joy out of it. This is not the will of God. You're not supposed to be a drain. You're supposed to be a fountain. I said, you're not supposed to be a drain. You're supposed to be a fountain. It's supposed to spring up in you. There should be a joy unspeakable and full of glory. You had a bad week. Okay, God's still on the throne. My leg hurts. My back's tired. But God's been good to me. And if he never blesses me again, it's going to be all right. I am the light of the world. I am reflecting the light of the world. I am let my light shine that men might see. What are they going to see? They're going to see Jesus. They're going to see hope. They're going to see joy. They're going to see embrace of a church that loves them. This is who we must be. So, I want to say it like this. You are the light of the world. His light shines first to you, and then it shines through you. His light shines to you, and now you let your light shine. There's a million things you can't fix, but you can leave it better than you found it. There's a million sad situations you can't fix, but you can speak hope into sorrow. You can, you can find somebody who would astonish, it would astonish them for you to do an act of kindness for them. And you can show them an act of kindness. A relationship that has fallen apart, a relationship that is damaged and you think it's over, you can shock them by your willingness to show forgiveness, love, and accept it. Hear me, love is not a feeling, love is an action. Take action in your life. Helen Keller said this, and I'm going to end. I am only one, but I am still one. I cannot do everything, but I still, but still I can do something.
And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Jesus. We have a broken woman here. We don't know how she ended up like this. Maybe you can join in to our religious exclusion party where we show the whole community that she's bad and we are good. Would you like to join that party? We're having it right here. We brought rocks. And Jesus says, no, there's no insiders and outsiders. (laughs) Let me tell you what there is. There's a heart problem. And we, all of us, need mercy and renewal in our heart. And so Jesus says, go and sin no more. That's the light of the world right there. Let's all stand. Would you step out of the chair you're in? Let's come stand here as we do on Sundays. Let's come gather in here to the front. We're going to sing together for a few moments. We're going to reflect together for a few moments. Uh, But I I feel the presence of the Lord here today. And I've preached a little longer than I intended, but that's just how it works sometimes. I'm sorry. As you come, would would you let your hearts be open to God? Would you let your spirits be directed heavenward? Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to be your people and we want to do it the way you would approve of. We want to do church the way you would approve of. We want to we want to do life the way you would approve of, oh God. We want to accept people. Uh, we want to believe in people. We want to forgive people. We, we don't want to specialize in walls, God. We, we want to specialize in gatherings. We, we don't want to specialize in exclusions. We want to specialize in inclusions. And, and Lord Jesus, as much as is reasonable and as much as is manageable, we want to be a place where we don't just point out the sin in others. We acknowledge the sin in ourselves. And we don't just point out the wrongdoing of others. We acknowledge the wrongdoing in ourselves. And thus we are humbled in your presence. And thus we are changed by your your presence. Lord God, would you speak to all of us today? Would you let your spirit move across these people, these beautiful people that are striving in their heart to serve you? Would you let your light shine into them, not just as a formula of truth, God, but as a nature of being, a manner of ministry. We want to get you your 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 style your tone your we want to get your your character we want to get the essence of what this thing is god and we want to project it out to our world that you have placed us in oh god in jesus name we pray in jesus name we pray oh hello in your own way would you just talk to the lord right now with your own words Let's go ahead and admit it here you're in a situation you need to change the way you're responding to it <laughs> I'm right here with you, so let's pray together. Lord Jesus, oh God, we want to let your light shine through us and how we administrate your word, how we administrate your grace, how we handle mercy. It's all all part of the proof of claim that we make as Christians. And Lord Jesus, Give us the strength to see beyond the simplistic and see the depth of ministry and the depth of influence that the church has in the world. I pray for all of these who have confessed. They have made a confession in your presence today. They need a, they need a better plan in a circumstance. They're in a, they're in a, they're in a, they're in a situation. They need a better plan than the one they've been doing of their own hand. God, I pray you'd let your wisdom flow into them. I let you. I pray you'd let the, the, the word that we talk about together and the, the scriptures we reference together be a guide to them, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. In Jesus' name, I pray. reach out and put a hand on your shoulder's neighbor or take their hand, whatever's whatever's comfortable. Let's pray as a, a, a body here before we're dismissed. Lord Jesus, pray for my brother, pray for my sister. I pray your strength upon them, oh God. I pray your anointing within them, Lord Jesus. I pray for a wisdom. Lord 
Jesus, we don't want to just have a thousand opinions, Lord. We want to have some, some, some biblical and scriptural wisdom to manage all the complexity of our lives, oh God. In Jesus' name, would you, would you strengthen us? I pray you would anoint our church, God. I pray that, I pray first of all for every ministry in our church, Lord, every small group, every Sunday school class every volunteer, every attendee, every giver. I want to pray, Lord, that you would help us do ministry right and help us get the culture of Christianity right, God. Praying that there would be a, uh, there would be a, 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 a gospel style to everything we do. Where we can say that we, we're not just the light of a salvation formula. We're not just the light of a theological understanding, but we are the light that is shown by charity. We are the light that's shown by forgiveness. We are the light that's shown by an unwillingness to judge. We are, we are the light that is shown by being unwilling to exalt ourselves above anyone else. We want to be that kind of light too, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you praise the Lord again? Hallelujah. 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 God bless you all. I love all of you. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Anybody with a special need, special prayer, please don't slip out. My ministry team will be down front. They will be a prayer partner with you. They will pray with you. They will call out your name this week. Please don't slip away if you have a specific need. If you're new around here, if you'd like to get to know us a little bit better, please come to my First Steps class next door. You'll see the slide. Thank you for watching First Church Charlotte. If you're in the Charlotte, North Carolina area, come join us at 4929 North Sharon Amity Road at the corner of Shamrock Drive, Sunday mornings at 9 and 11 a.m., and Bible study Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. Online, find us at firstchurchclt.com or like us on Facebook or Twitter. We hope to see you soon. Come worship with us.